Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. Hermione Granger had worried she was turning bad. The difference between good and bad was usually easy to grasp. She'd never understood why other people had so much trouble. At Hogwarts, good was Professor Flitwick and Professor McGonagall and Professor Sprout. Bad was Professor Snape and Professor Quirrell and Draco Malfoy. Harry Potter was one of those unusual cases where you couldn't tell just by looking. She was still trying to figure out where he belonged. But when it came to herself, Hermione was having too much fun crushing Harry Potter. It had started on the day of the train ride, though it had taken a while for the whirlwind to sink in. It wasn't until later that night that Hermione had begun to realize just how much she'd let that boy walk all over her. Before she'd met Harry Potter, she hadn't had anyone she'd wanted to crush. If someone wasn't doing as well as her in class, it was her job to help them, not rub it in. That was what it meant to be good. And now, now she was winning. Harry Potter was flinching every time she got another house point, and it was so much fun. That was bad, wasn't it? Hermione had worried she was turning bad. And then a thought had come to her which wiped away all her fears. She and Harry were getting into a romance. Of course! Everyone knew what it meant when a boy and a girl started fighting all the time. They were courting one another. There was nothing bad about that. It couldn't be that she just enjoyed beating the living scholastic daylights out of the most famous student in the school. Someone who was in books and talked like books. The boy who had somehow vanquished the Dark Lord and even smushed Professor Snape like a sad little bug. The boy who was, as Professor Curl would have put it, dominant over everyone else in first year Ravenclaw except for Hermione Granger, who was utterly squishing the boy who lived in all his classes besides broomstick riding because that would have been bad. No, it was romance. That was it. That was why they were fighting. Hermione was glad she had figured this out in time for today, when Harry would lose their book reading contest, which the whole school knew about, and she wanted to start dancing with the sheer overflowing joy of it. It was 2.45 on Saturday, and Harry Potter had half of Bathilda Bagshot's A History of Magic left to read, and the entire Ravenclaw common room was watching. 2.46 p.m. The tension was unbearable. If it had been anyone else, anyone else, his defeat would have been a foregone conclusion. But this was Harry Potter, and you couldn't rule out the possibility that he would, sometime in the next few seconds, raise a hand and snap his fingers. Ten seconds left, and he still hadn't raised his hand. Five seconds left. 2.47 p.m. I would like to note, for the benefit of posterity, that I had only half a book left and that I ran into a number of unexpected delays. You lost! You did! You lost our contest! Do you realize what kind of week I've had? Any lesser being would have been hard-pressed to read eight Dr. Seuss books! I did not have any logical way of knowing I'd have to save the entire school from Professor Snape or get beaten up in defense class. 
And if I told you how I lost all the time between 5 p.m. and dinner on Thursday, you would think I was insane. Aw, it sounds like someone fell prey to the planning fallacy. Oh, that reminds me. I finished reading the first batch of books you lent me. Someday, when the distant descendants of Homo sapiens are looking back over the history of the galaxy and wondering how it all went so wrong, they will conclude that the original mistake was when someone taught Hermione Granger how to read. But you still lose. Now what exactly should you lose, I wonder? You lost the bet, so you have to pay a forfeit. I don't remember agreeing to this! Really? We'll take a vote then. Everyone in Ravenclaw who thinks Harry Potter has to pay up, raise your hand. What?! You don't know what she's going to ask! Don't you realize what she's doing? She's getting you to make an advance commitment now, and then the pressure of consistency will make you agree with whatever she says afterwards! Don't worry. If she asks for something unreasonable, we can just change our minds. Right, everyone? And there were eager nods from all the girls whom Penelope Clearwater had told about Hermione's plan. A silent figure quietly slipped through the chilled halls of the Hogwarts dungeons. He was to be present in a certain room at 6 p.m. to meet a certain someone, and if at all possible, it was best to be early, to show respect. But when his hand turned the doorknob and opened the door into that dark, silent, unused classroom, there was a silhouette already standing there amid the rows of dusty old desks. The silhouette slowly turned to behold him, revealing a shadowed face only partially lit by the eerie green light. Draco liked this meeting already. Keep the chill green light, make them both taller, give them hoods and masks, move them from a classroom to a graveyard, and it would be just like the start of half the stories his father's friends told about the Death Eaters. I want you to know, Draco Malfoy, that I do not blame you for my recent defeat. Draco opened his mouth in unthinking protest. There was no possible reason why he should be blamed. It was due, more than anything else, to my own stupidity. You did not ask me to do exactly what I did. You only asked for help. It was I who unwisely chose that particular method. But the fact remains that I lost the contest by half a book. The actions of your pet idiot and the favor you asked for and, yes, my own foolishness in going about it caused me to lose time. More time than you know. Time which, in the end, proved critical. The fact remains, Draco Malfoy, that if you had not asked that favor, I would have won, and not, instead, lost. Draco had already heard about Harry's loss and the forfeit Granger had claimed from him. I understand. I'm sorry. I am not asking for understanding or sorrow, but I have just spent two full hours in the presence of Hermione Granger, dressed in such clothing as was provided me, visiting such fascinating places in Hogwarts as a tiny burbling waterfall of what looked to me like snot, accompanied by a number of other girls who insisted on such helpful activities as strewing our path with transfigured rose petals. I have been on a date, Scion of Malfoy. My first date. And when I call that favor due, you will pay it. Draco nodded solemnly. Before arriving, he had taken the wise precaution of learning every available detail of Harry's date, so that he could get all of his hysterical laughing done before their appointed meeting time. Do you think that something sad ought to happen to the Granger girl? Spread the word in Slytherin that the Granger girl is mine, and anyone who meddles in my affairs will have their remains scattered over an area wide enough to include twelve different spoken languages. And since I am not in Gryffindor and I use cunning rather than immediate frontal attacks, they should not panic if I am seen smiling at her. Or if you're seen on a second date. There will be no second date! If Harry Potter did become the next Dark Lord someday, Draco would use a pensieve to store a copy of this memory somewhere safe. And Harry Potter would never dare betray him. But let us talk of happier matters. Let us talk of knowledge and of power. Draco Malfoy... Let us talk of science. I offer you power, and I will tell you of that power and its price. The power comes from knowing the shape of reality and so gaining control over it. What you understand, you can command, and that is power enough to walk upon the moon. The price of that power is that you must learn to ask questions of nature, and far more difficult, accept nature's answers. You will do experiments, perform tests, and see what happens and you must accept the meaning of those results when they tell you that you are mistaken. 
You will have to learn how to lose, not to me, but to nature. You will find this painful, Draco Malfoy, and I do not know if you are strong in that way. Knowing the price, is it still your wish to learn the human power? Yes. He'd thought about this, and it was hard to see how he could answer any other way. He'd been instructed to take every avenue of friendship with Harry Potter. It was just learning. He wasn't promising to do anything. He could always stop the lessons at any time. There were certainly any number of things about the situation which made it look like a trap, but in all honesty, Draco didn't see how this could go wrong. Plus, Draco did kind of want to rule the world. I have had something of a crowded week, and it will take some time to plan your curriculum. I've got a lot of things I need to do myself to consolidate my power in Slytherin. Not to mention homework. Maybe we should just start in October? Sounds sensible. But what I meant to say is that to plan your curriculum, I need to know what I will be teaching you. Three thoughts came to me. The first is that I teach you of the human mind and brain. The second option is that I teach you of the physical universe, those arts which lie on the pathway to visiting the moon. This involves a great deal of numbers, but to a certain kind of mind, those numbers are more beautiful than anything else science has to teach. Do you like numbers, Draco? Then so much for that. You will learn your mathematics eventually, but not right away, I think. The third option is that I teach you of genetics and evolution and inheritance, what you would call blood. That one. I thought you might say as much, but I think it will be the most painful path for you, Draco. What if your family and friends, the blood purists, say one thing, and you find that the experimental test says another? Then I'll figure out a way to make the experimental test say the right answer. Um... It doesn't really work like that. That's what I was trying to warn you about here, Draco. You can't make the answers come out to be anything you like. You can always make the answer come out your way. It's just a matter of finding the right arguments. No! No, no, no! Then you get the wrong answer, and you can't go to the moon that way. Nature isn't a person. You can't trick them into believing something else. If you try to tell the moon it's made of cheese, you can argue for days and it won't change the moon. What you're talking about is rationalization. The power of science comes from finding out the way nature really is that can't be changed by arguing. What science can do is tell us how blood really works, how wizards really inherit their powers from their parents, and whether muggleborns are really weaker or stronger. Stronger? You think mudbloods are stronger? I think nothing. I know nothing. I believe nothing. I will figure out how to test the magical strength of Muggleborns and the magical strength of Purebloods. If my tests tell me that Muggleborns are weaker, I will believe they are weaker. If my tests tell me that Muggleborns are stronger, I will believe they are stronger. Knowing this and other truths, I will gain some measure of power. And you expect me to believe whatever you say? I expect you to perform the tests personally. Are you afraid of what you will find? Draco stared at the shadowy figure for a while, his eyes narrowed. Nice trap, Harry. I'll have to remember that one. It's new. It's not a trap, Draco. Remember, I don't know what we'll find. But you do not understand the universe by arguing with it or telling it to come back with a different answer next time. When you put on the robes of a scientist, you must forget all your politics and arguments and factions and sides. Silence the desperate clingings of your mind and wish only to hear the answer of nature. Most people can't do it. That's why this is difficult. Are you sure you wouldn't rather just learn about the brain? And if I tell you I'd rather learn about the brain, you'll go around telling people that I was afraid of what I'd find. No, I will do no such thing. But you might still do the same sort of tests yourself. And if you got the wrong answer, I wouldn't be there to say anything before you showed it to someone else. I would still ask you first, Draco. Draco paused. He hadn't been expecting that. He'd thought he saw the trap, but... You would? Of course. How would I know who to blackmail or what we could ask from them? Draco, I say again, this is not a trap I set for you. At least, not for you personally. If your politics were different, I would be saying, what if the test shows that purebloods are stronger? Really? Yes! That's the price anyone has to pay to become a scientist! He had to think. The shadowy, greenlit figure waited. 
It didn't take long to think about, though. If you discarded all the confusing parts, then Harry Potter was planning to mess around with something that could cause a gigantic political explosion, and it would be insane to just walk away and let him do it on his own. We'll study blood. Excellent! Congratulations on being willing to ask the question. Look, Harry, I thought the idea was to take all the things that muggles know, combine them with things that wizards know, and become masters of both worlds. Wouldn't it be a lot easier to just study all the things that muggles already found out, like the moon stuff, and use that power? No! If you cannot learn the scientist's art of accepting reality, then I must not tell you what that acceptance has discovered. It would be like a powerful wizard telling you of those gates which must not be opened and those seals which must not be broken before you had proven your intelligence and discipline by surviving the lesser perils. All right, I understand. Father had told him that many times. When a more powerful wizard told you that you weren't ready to know, you didn't pry any further if you wanted to live. Indeed, but there is something else you should understand. The first scientists, being muggles, lacked your traditions. In the beginning, they simply did not comprehend the notion of dangerous knowledge, and thought that all things known should be spoken freely. When their searches turned dangerous, they told their politicians of things that should have stayed secret. Don't look like that, Draco. It wasn't simple stupidity. They did have to be smart enough to uncover the secret in the first place. But they were muggles. It was the first time they'd found anything really dangerous, and they didn't start out with a tradition of secrecy. There was a war going on, and the scientists on one side worried that if they didn't talk, the scientists of the enemy country would tell their politicians first. They didn't destroy the world, but it was close. And we are not going to repeat that mistake. Right. We won't. We're wizards, and studying science doesn't make us muggles. As you say, we will establish our own science, a magical science, and that science will have smarter traditions from the very start. The knowledge I share with you will be taught alongside the disciplines of accepting truth. The level of this knowledge will be key to your progress in those disciplines, and you will share that knowledge with no one else who has not learned those disciplines. Do you accept this? Yes. What was he supposed to do? Say no? Good. And what you discover for yourself, you will keep to yourself unless you think that other scientists are ready to know it. What we do share among ourselves, we will not tell the world unless we agree it is safe for the world to know. And whatever our own politics and allegiances, we will all punish any of our number who reveal dangerous magics or give away dangerous weapons, no matter what sort of war is going on. From this day onward, that will be the tradition and the law of science among wizards. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Actually, this was starting to sound pretty attractive. The Death Eaters had tried to take power by being scarier than everyone else, and they hadn't actually won yet. Maybe it was time to try ruling using secrets instead. And our group stays hidden for as long as possible, and everyone in it has to agree to our rules. Of course, definitely. And what do we call ourselves? The Science Eaters? No, that doesn't sound right. What had the Dark Lord been thinking? Father had said the Dark Lord was smart. I've got it! You won't understand yet, but trust me, it fits. Right now, Draco would have accepted Malfoy munchers as long as it changed the subject. This day shall mark the dawn of... The Bayesian Conspiracy. A silent figure trudged wearily through the halls of Hogwarts in the direction of Ravenclaw. It wasn't even 7pm yet, but it was well past bedtime for Harry. He'd realized last night that he wasn't able to use the time turner on Saturday until after the book reading contest was already over. But he could still use the time turner on Friday night and gain time that way. So Harry had pushed himself to stay awake until 9pm on Friday when the protective shell opened and then used the four hours remaining on the time turner to spin back to 5pm and collapse into sleep. He'd woken up around 2am on Saturday morning just as planned and read for the next 12 hours straight. And it still hadn't been enough. And now, Harry would be going to sleep rather early for the next few days until his sleep cycle caught up again. And Harry staggered up the stairs to his dorm room, changed into his pajamas, and collapsed into bed. And found that his pillow seemed rather lumpy. Harry groaned. He sat up reluctantly, twisted in bed, and lifted up his pillow. This revealed a note, two golden galleons, and a book titled Occlumency, The Hidden Art. 
Harry picked up the note and read. My, you do get yourself into trouble, and quickly. James himself was no match for you. You have made a powerful enemy. Snape commands the loyalty, admiration, and fear of all House Slytherin. You cannot trust any of that house now, whether they come to you in friendly guise or fearsome. From now on, you must not meet Snape's eyes. He is a legilimens, and he can read your mind if you do. I have enclosed a book which may help you learn to protect yourself, though there is only so far you can get without a tutor. Still, you may hope to at least detect intrusion. So that you may find extra time in which to study occlumency, I have enclosed two galleons, which is the price of answer sheets and homework for the first year history of magic class. Professor Binns having given the same test and same assignments every year since he died. Your newfound friends the Weasley twins should be able to sell you a copy. It goes without saying that you must not get caught with it in your possession. Of Professor Quirrell I know little. He is a Slytherin and a defense professor, and that is two marks against him. Consider carefully any advice he gives you, and tell him nothing you do not wish known. Dumbledore only pretends to be insane. He is extremely intelligent, and if you continue to step into closets and vanish, he will certainly deduce your possession of an invisibility cloak, if he has not done so already. Avoid him whenever possible. Hide the cloak of invisibility somewhere safe, not your pouch, any time you cannot avoid him, and step with great care in his presence. Please be more careful in the future, Harry Potter. Signed, Santa Claus. Harry stared at the note. It did seem to be pretty good advice. Of course, Harry wasn't going to cheat in history class even if they gave him a dead monkey for a professor. But Severus's legilimency... Whoever sent this note knew a lot of important secret things and was willing to tell Harry about them. The note was still warning him against Dumbledore stealing the cloak, but at this point Harry honestly had no clue if that was a bad sign. It could just be an understandable mistake. There seemed to be some sort of intrigue going on inside Hogwarts. Maybe if Harry compared stories between Dumbledore and the note sender, he could work out a combined picture that would be accurate? Like, if they both agreed on something, then... Well, whatever. It was Sunday morning, and Harry was eating pancakes in the Great Hall. It was 8.02 a.m., and in precisely two hours and one minute, it would be exactly one week since he'd seen the Weasleys and crossed over onto Platform 9 and 3 quarters. And the thought had occurred to him, Harry didn't know if this was a valid way to think about the universe, he didn't know anything anymore, but it seemed possible that not enough interesting things had happened to him over the last week. When he was done eating breakfast, Harry planned to go straight up to his room and hide in the bottom level of his trunk and not talk to anyone until 10.03 a.m. And that was when Harry saw the Weasley twins walking toward him. He should scream and run away. He should scream and run away. Whatever this was, it could very well be the grand finale. He really should just scream and run away. With a resigned feeling that the universe would come and get him anyway, Harry continued slicing at the pancake with his fork and knife. He couldn't muster the energy. That was the sad truth. The Weasley twins arrived, grinning brightly. Hello, Fred. Hello, George. You sound tired. You should cheer up. Look what we got you. That's not right. Harry Potter was born on the 31st of Jul- he is coming! The one who will tear apart the very... Dumbledore had leapt out of his throne and run straight over to the head table and seized hold of the woman speaking those awful words. Fox had appeared in a flash, and all three of them vanished in a crack of fire. There was a shocked pause, followed by heads turning in the direction of Harry Potter. That was a prophecy, and I bet it's about you. It's not about me! Obviously! I'm not coming here, I'm already here! Then who is it about? And with a dull, leaden sensation, Harry realized who wasn't already at Hogwarts. Call it a wild guess, but Harry had a feeling the undead Dark Lord would be showing up one of these days. And Harry was sitting in the cavern level of his trunk, slid shut and locked so no one could get in, waiting for the week to be over. 10.01 10.02. 10.03, but just to be sure, 10.04, and the first week was done. A few moments later, he had emerged into the bright sunlit air of his dorm. 
Shortly after, and he was in the Ravenclaw common room. A few people looked at him, but no one said anything or tried to talk to him. Harry pulled back a comfortable chair and sat down. Mum and Dad had told Harry in no uncertain terms that while they understood his enthusiasm for leaving home and getting away from his parents, he was to write them every week without fail, just so they knew that he was alive, unharmed, and not in prison. Let's see... After leaving his parents at the train station, he'd... gotten acquainted with a boy raised by Darth Vader, become friends with the three most infamous pranksters in Hogwarts, met Hermione, then there'd been the incident with the sorting hat. Monday, he'd been given a time machine to treat his sleep disorder, gotten an invisibility cloak from an unknown benefactor, rescued seven Hufflepuffs by staring down five scary older boys, one of whom had threatened to break his finger, realized that he possessed a mysterious dark side, learned to cast Frigidiro in Charms class, and gotten started on his rivalry with Hermione. Tuesday had introduced astronomy, taught by Professor Aurora Sinistra, who was nice, and history of magic taught by a ghost who ought to be exercised and replaced with a tape recorder. Wednesday, he'd been pronounced the most dangerous student in the classroom. Thursday, well, let's not even think about Thursday. Friday, the incident in potions class, followed by his blackmailing the headmaster, followed by the defense professor having him beaten up in class, followed by the defense professor turning out to be the most awesome human being who still walked the face of the earth. Saturday, he'd lost a bet and gone on his first date and started redeeming Draco. And then this morning, Professor Trelawney's unheard prophecy might or might not indicate that an immortal Dark Lord was about to attack Hogwarts. Harry mentally organized his material and started writing. Dear Mum and Dad, Hogwarts is a lot of fun. I learned how to violate the second law of thermodynamics in charms class, and I met a girl named Hermione Granger who reads faster than I do. I'd better leave it at that. Your loving son, Harry James Potter Evans Varys.